Now you talk about terror. I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. Hi, I'm Chris Hedges. Welcome to Days of Revolt. Following the attacks in Brussels and the attacks in Paris, there has been an outcry for increased military force against the territory ISIS controls, more draconian infringements upon civil liberties in Europe as a way to curb Islamic radicalism or terrorism, and yet absent from that discussion is the state terror that we visit and have visited 15 years in Afghanistan, 13 years in Iraq, which has created forms of brutalization and rage that fuel directly these attacks and further attacks to come. And with me to discuss this reality are two combat veterans, Michael Haynes, who served in the U.S. Marine Corps from 1994 to 2004. He was in Iraq in 2003 in the most senior recon platoon. That's the equivalent of Marines, equivalent of the SEALs. First Force Reconnaissance Company Marine, 1st Marine Division. He was engaged in direct action raids in Baghdad. He currently works for Veterans for Peace, is an activist and problem solver, and aids veterans in the transition process, especially putting them back in touch with nature. Also joining me is Rory Fanning. He served in two deployments in Afghanistan between 2002 and 2004. He was in the 2nd Army Ranger Battalion. He also is a war resistor, and Donald Trump resistor was in the Chicago, helped shut down the Chicago Rally of Trump, there's something to be proud of. He's the author of Worth Fighting For, An Army Ranger's Journey Out of the Military and Across America. Uh, he also walked across the United States for the Pat Tillman Foundation in 2008 and 2009 and is, like Michael, a member of Veterans for Peace. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Chris. So let's begin with this reality that is not acknowledged by very many people, certainly not by the media, of what we have done to Iraqis, Syrians, Afghans, and, and maybe I'll begin with you, Rory. You were deployed, I mean, shortly after the uh, occupation of Afghanistan, is that correct? Correct. In late 2002, I was deployed with 2nd Army Ranger Battalion. Uh, what I didn't know as I entered the country was that the Taliban had essentially surrendered after the initial assault by the Air Force and the Special Forces. And our job was essentially to draw the Taliban back into the fight. Why? Explain why. Well, because surrender wasn't good enough for our politicians after 9-11. We wanted blood. We wanted a head count. And it really didn't matter who it was. Um, so we'd walk up to people, people who um, had been occupied in the decade prior, involved in civil war before that, with tons of money at our disposal. And we said, hey, we will give you this amount of money if you'd point out to a member of the Taliban. And uh, an Afghan would say, sure, absolutely. There's a member right there. And we'd go next door, land in their neighbor's front yard, uh, put it's a probably, bag. Probably the guy was flirting with his, with his wife or something. For whatever reason. <laughs> right. For whatever reason. We I would, saw that in Salvador, that. all the informants. Nice way to get rid of all the people you don't like. Uh -huh. Right, right. So we'd land in there. We'd put a bag over every military-aged person's head, whether they were a member of the Taliban or not, give the person who identified that person uh, money, and then that person would also get that neighbor, neighbor's property. So, you know, in a, in a country with as much desperation and poverty of, as Afghanistan at the time, you do anything to put money on your, or food on your, your family's table. And essentially that's what we were doing. But we were also bringing people that had absolutely no stake in the fight into the war. And um, so we were creating enemies. You know, my, I signed up after 9-11 to prevent another 9-11 from happening. But soon after entering Afghanistan, I, was, I realized I was only created the conditions for more terrorist attacks. And it was, it was a hard pill to swallow. I mean, we were, um, 
essentially a bully, you know. Right. Well, worse than a bully. I mean, you, you know, we murder. Well, we'd have a rocket land in our camp, and we wouldn't necessarily know where it came from. It came from that general direction over there. We'd call in a 500-pound bomb, and it would land on a village. I mean, we know the International Physicians Against the Prevention of Nuclear War, um, which no won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985, that a million people have been killed around the world since 9-11. You know, we know conservatively that at least 80% of those people have been innocent civilians. So, yeah, you know, I think to understand Brussels, you have to get to the root yeah. of some of this stuff. <clears throat> and, and, and maybe, Michael, you can talk a little bit about your experience in Iraq. Yes, uh, um, well, I mean, you know, the same, same thing with me, really. Uh, I was in the Iraq invasion, and uh, we pushed up into Baghdad, and uh, things, things began really very real for me when we began to, uh, to kick in doors, place charges in doors, and, and rush into these homes and terrorize these people. Uh, the, you know, we're, I would say probably about 50% or more of the intel that we got was just dead wrong. And uh, busting in these doors, you come into a family's house and there's elderly women, young little girls, three, four years old, just screaming and horrific, just terrified to where they literally soil themselves or pee their pants. And, you know, and then you're, you're taking grandma and throwing her up against the wall and interrogating her. And that, you know, hits you right here. It hits you really hard. And that's when I began to ask myself, what the hell am I doing? You know? And, uh, and then if you happen to be a young man in there, in your early 20s or anywhere in that range where you could carry a weapon, then just by mere association of being a young male, a possible insurgent, Saddam Fadahim loyalist, whatever the case may be, you were taken out of the home and taken somewhere to be interrogated. And, and often tortured if you were turned, especially if you were turned over to the Iraqis. Exactly. I mean, who knows what happened to them after we let them go to be interrogated. And I, I know they were, they were there you know, all night interrogating them, and who knows if they even made it back to their family or not. I think what most people who haven't been in war zones don't understand is the uh, lethal power and indiscriminate lethal power of the American military. So for instance, if an IED goes off in Iraq, you immediately lay down suppressing fire. This is usually belt-fed saws, which are light 7.62 machine guns, and you don't stick around and see who's been shot and who hasn't. Uh, so that after just one incident like that, and, and when you were in early years in Iraq, certainly by 2004, you were seeing a lot of it, um, you know, you'd spray these mud-walled homes, you know, in a kind of circumference. A lot of collateral damage from something like that, and it's not too much different than what's going on today with the drone attacks. Right. Uh, the, with the drone attacks, I mean, the, you know, you. You have there's a range, an outside range, where so many so many civilians are being killed from these attacks, and it's really, quite frankly, it's a terrorist-producing factory. Yeah. I mean, if you lose your child, if you lose your mother, uh, any of your family members to this, I mean, it, we have to think about that. Put yourself in that position. If I lost my child, I would be desperate. What would you do? You know, it's it's easy to understand why someone would put a strap a bomb to yeah. themselves and go. There's blow a passage up. in a great book by J. Glenn Gray. I don't know if you know it. Or, or, Warriors, Reflections on Men in Battle. He was a combat officer in World War II in Italy, uh, and he served with people whose entire families they were, uh, you know, Europeans were were destroyed in bombing raids. And he said at that point, forget the whole adage, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. They want total annihilation. Mm -hmm. And I think you see that rising up with ISIS. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not condoning it. I mean, to understand is not to condone. But the problem is we don't understand. What, what did, let's ask you, Rory, first, what did you think, you know, when you saw the latest attacks in Brussels? You know, I look back at some of my military training, and I think we have to talk about racism on a lot of mm. different levels here, because I think killing another human being is one of the most unnatural things you can do. And I think you have to be conditioned to do it. And you have to learn to see the person you're told to kill as the other, right. or less than. And so we didn't refer to the people in Afghanistan as Afghans. They're Haji, you know, which is a term of respect or, you know, um, for someone who's gone and made the trip to Mecca. But we use it in a derogatory term. And, you know, you can go to any number of, you know, uh, wars and, and see similar type, um, you know, racism, you know, kind of embedded and ingrained into the minds of the troops. And I think, you know, it's, you can't help but have that transfer 
back home. And the amount of disenfranchised people, you know, because they were born in Morocco or, you know, Algeria or came from Iraq, and these people are treated as others, you know, and um, they can't help but feel detached and, you know, isolated from the rest of the society. And I, you know, going through the training and being conditioned to, you know, see people as less than or other, you know, um, I'm, I'm kind of seeing the same thing in our society. Well, you, you of, have so. Marine Corps chants. You can probably give us one, which are about killing, right? Yes. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. The, uh, what we, I, I remember being over there, the terms, you know, sand nigger, haji, barbarian, terrorist, all these things were th thrown around uh, as if they were sub, the people there were subhuman. And, um, you know, personally, I, I can, after my experiences, I look at myself as more of a global citizen. I, I look at, uh, I have a problem with uh, people raising flags. It, it looks like that that's more of a division thing that separates I have, I have stories. I have the same, you know, 20 years overseas, and I was in New York in 9-11, and my son was 10 uh, and, uh, on 9-11, and he said, Daddy, what's the difference between the people who have the big American flags waving on their car and the small ones. I said, well, the ones with the big American flags are the really big assholes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think that's something you can probably totally relate to. Definitely. Uh, because the narrative of, you know, that spun out for the popular consumption about war and thank you for your service and is completely at, at odds with the reality. And you will have people that maybe aren't self-aware or for whatever reasons of self-aggrandizement will buy into it. But for a veteran who comes back and is self-aware, um, the narrative itself has got to be incredibly alienating. Yeah, I think a lot of soldiers who've come back from war um, see themselves as anything but a hero. And to kind of throw that term around so loosely, right. I think it's, it's dangerous. And it's also a way to manipulate soldiers, too. I think it buys their silence, you mm. know, at baseball games and concerts right. and whatnot. You know, if you're a hero, you don't do anything wrong. You know, the mission that you carry out is just and should have happened. Um, so c soldiers are not encouraged to talk about the realities of war when they come back, if they're labeled hero or warrior. Um, and I think that's a major problem. And I think that only leads to further seclusion and isolation with soldiers. We talk about the suicide rate amongst veterans, you know, 22 a day in this country. It's because we're not allowed to talk about what we saw overseas, how unjust it was, how we feel like bullies, how, you know, how many innocent people have been killed uh, since 9-11. And uh, I think throwing on words like heroes really does a disservice to the experience well, of it, veterans it also, and all the innocent people who have been killed since 9 And yeah. it doesn't, I think, <clears throat> acknowledge this very real existential crisis because when you come back and know the reality of who we are, and what we have done, and you match it with the rhetoric of, you know, the greatest nation and virtue and liberating the women of Afghanistan and on and on and on, it, you're pounded day in and day out by the lies that are told to you by the press, by the entertainment industry, by religious institutions, uh, and you're already coping with significant trauma. Um, I, I will get you to comment, but it's certainly been my experience that, um, and you know, I suffered PTSD, but that the worst PTSD is caused not finally by what you saw, but what you did. Moral injury, really. And moral injury is, is huge with the, with the conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think that, that has a direct reflection with the high, extremely high suicide rate that we see that is estimated about 22 per day. Um, you know, these I mean- are, These are Iraq and Afghan vets? Uh, yes, yeah, 22 per Just day. Just from Iraq and Afghanistan. Wow, I didn't know Correct. that. That's a tremendously high number. Oh. And, um, you know, when, when we're, so, we're sold the idea of, hey, we're going to go liberate a people, we're fighting terrorism, and then we get in in the mix of things and realize that we are the ones terrorizing the people there, that really torments you psychologically. I've lost a few friends due to suicide. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of, I, I went through this when I got back, isolation is a big thing initially. You have your phases, your isolation, your anger. Then you finally get to the point where you want to do something about it and talk about it and make a difference. Well, let's talk about what we have to do. Um, I mean, really, with all of the presidential candidates, I would even include Bernie Sanders. I'll get your comment on that. I don't think any of them are addressing the reality of what's happening in the Middle East, and I think that they're paying deference to 
forms of violence and military, the projection of military power that is creating exactly the kinds of things we saw in Brussels. But, you know, maybe I'll start with you, Rory. Yeah, I think there's been absolutely zero questions regarding foreign policy in any of these debates, um, particularly the Democratic debate. You know, we saw Hillary Clinton at the APAC conference. We saw Bernie Sanders' speech, although critical of Israel. You know, you know, this is a, a apartheid situation happening in Israel and an occupation that is happening. And, you know, to not speak out against that and to also not speak out against the fact that we spend 10 times the amount of money we spend on education, on our military. We have 700 military bases around the world. This is completely unsustainable on all different types of levels. To not be speaking out against, you know, the... Um, ubiquitous nature of the U.S. military right now. We've invaded, four, we've had military operations in 49 of the 54 African countries since 2011. Why isn't anybody talking about this stuff? National sovereignty does not exist for any country around the world except the United States. And um, well, we attack all sorts of countries we, we're, we're not formally at war with. I mean, 150 we do it people day. in Somalia a couple weeks right. ago. Drone strike. <clears throat> right. And, and, how do you think, I mean, especially on the one hand, because it's not part of the national debate, because there's a kind of deification of the military and a, and a sacralization of quote unquote military values, which as you and I know are fictitious, um, how does one confront what's happening? Because it has very dangerous consequences in terms of blowback, in, in terms of the, you know, expanding campaigns of terror that are being visited by the U.S. military, which is just now expanding, as you point out, into Africa and everywhere else. Well, how, what, what do we have to do? You know, it's, uh, that's, that's one of the main reasons why we're a part of Veterans for Peace. I mean, that, that's our outlet. To, to, we have the support group there that we can get out and mm. talk about these things. Um, it, it's very scary when your political leaders are not addressing these things. At least I will give Bernie Sanders credit for one thing. He's addressing climate change. Yes. Which that's well, that's, and economic inequality. Yes, yeah. and um, but but see, that's how the, low we've sunk. That somebody acknowledges a factual reality, and we're all ecstatic. Yes, right. correct. Uh, and, and then, I mean, the, really, the, the two-party system. It, it, to me, it seems like two gangs that's been in, in yeah. charge of this country for. <laughs> well, there's no difference in terms of the expansion of empire. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's in fact it's deteriorated under Obama, the expansion of the drone wars under Obama, the decision that the executive branch has the right to assassinate American citizens. Uh, you do not want to give this kind of power to any government um, because uh, especially when they feel threatened, they'll use every lever they can pull. That's right. You went to the Trump rally in Chicago. We yes. have a little clip of that. I wanted to kind of expand a little bit. There is a Vets for Hate um, hashtag going on that Iraq Veterans Against the War and Veterans for Peace are, are promoting. I wanted to take that just a little bit further. Not that I don't think Vets for Hate is, is, a, small, is a really strong message, but I wanted to kind of extend that a little bit to Vets First um, Racism, War, and Empire, you know, because I think it's not just Trump, you know, not just Ted yeah. Cruz. It's Hillary Clinton, yeah. and it's potentially Bernie Sanders. It's this you know, this mindset that allows for, you know, these unending wars. I mean, we have, you talk about what do we do? I mean, it's, we're at a low point in the end. Talk about your experience, right? because you showed up, I think you were wearing the top part of your BDU, your uniform. So people saw you as a vet. So talk about until that moment when they realized that you weren't there to cheer on Donald Trump. Yeah, well, it was, uh, welcome home, brother. Thank you for your service. I mean, I literally got there early and sat there for three hours and oh. had new, dozens of people coming up to me and doing that. And uh, after they said the tr that Trump is canceling the rally, after an amazing multiracial protest that had basically half of the audience there to um, peacefully protest Donald Trump, um, Trump said, okay, I'm not going in there. And so I pulled out my flag and said, um, vets against racism, war and empire. And, you know, immediately someone threw a drink on me and I got hit from behind in the head three or four times. And, uh, you know, 
it, it was it was quite the, it was quite the switch, quite the pivot, you know, on on me, um, you know, questioning the narrative, questioning Donald Trump's narrative, um, you know, I was suddenly out of their good graces, we'll say. But uh, it was a good experience. Why is that important? I think it is important, but why? Why? Well, I think you got to stand up and you got to confront creeping fascism. Yeah. You have to you have to acknowledge this stuff because. You know, silence is consent in a lot of ways, and I don't think I, th I don't think you can just allow this type of thing to go unchallenged. Yeah, I would Chicago. agree it's, totally. I mean, I watched it in places like Yugoslavia, and, and what's kind of always fascinating is that um, these blowhards like Trump, or look at Chris Christie, who's now become the official greeter of Mar-a-Lago resorts, as far as I can tell, and, or Trump's mm -hmm. step and fetch it. You know, when you confront them, um, they actually. It, you know, deflate, maybe not in Christie's term literally, but they deflate pretty quickly. Uh, and that is something that I think has been illustrated throughout history. But it, you're right, it's the failure not to go. And I know Sanders actually criticized the people who disrupted the rally. I think he could not be more wrong. I don't know what you, know, what you feel, Michael. Well, I was just going to add on to that. I mean, it's pretty embarrassing when someone's, you know, running for president of this country gets on national news and says something like that we have to take out the families of terrorists, you know, condoning the, the drone strikes. And I mean, he's advocating war crimes right there. On but TV. he's not. But, you know, in a way, none of the other candidates, including Hillary Clinton, or I would even argue Bernie Sanders, since he wants the Saudis to do our bombing for us, mm. given what they do in Yemen, are really any different. Mm. Right. I mean, you know, that, you know, as you know, when you're dropping 500 or 1,000 pound iron fragmentation bombs, any discussion of surgical strikes is absurd. I mean, I saw that in Gaza. Well, I mean, Trump might even be to the left of Hillary Clinton, possibly Bernie Sanders on you know, foreign policy issues. And we don't military. know. He, we don't know yet. <laughs> yeah, we, he doesn't have much of a, any kind of plot policy plan laid out, but, uh, you know. What? I mean, we, we, you know, we're talking 15 years of war, longest war in American history. And, you know, you both, along with many other veterans, have been incredibly courageous. And, you know, not just the physical courage of being in war, but the moral courage, which is different. Um, but the moral courage to really stand up and name us for who we are, and call us out for our crimes and, and resist. What, what's been, you know, the hardest for you um, in this process? What, what's, you know, in this process of resistance, what's the most difficult aspect for you to deal with? That's a good question. Um, I would say for myself, it's a, you know, I, I just got involved with uh, Veterans for Peace and I'm involved with helping veterans with transitioning and other methods, taking them out to nature, teaching them how to grow food. It took me about 10 years to get to that point because I got out in 2004. So I, I had to go through my other processes, but, um, but you know, you, you got to stand for something in life. And uh, for me, doing the right thing and uh, getting involved and in, in helping the people that have been, who have been wronged, uh, for me, it's, it, it's uh, a post-traumatic growth. Well, you went, weren't you in experience. Okinawa? Did you go to the Okinawa? Yes, yeah, so I just recently, I was on a trip to Okinawa with the Veterans for Peace. And, uh, we demonstrated there. Protesting now, the military bases where you once served. Exactly, yes. I, I was stationed <laughs> there 20 years ago. And uh, so this time I got, I got to spend two weeks, roughly two weeks out there where I was on the other end of the spectrum, spending time with the people, uh, listening to their struggles and actually seeing what's happening over there. So I participated in them with our protests and, you know, stood in front of trucks, yeah. laid out in the road, blocked uh, construction crews coming in there because they want to completely uh, destroy a, a, a very pristine area that has, uh, you know, all kinds of biological life, dugons, uh, which is a type of manatee, and build this new base uh, for Futima as their place, air base they're gonna close and they propose to open this one. But Okinawa has 74% of the forces that are in Japan right. are in Okinawa. Right, we didn't even get into male violence against women, exploitation yeah. of women, and which grows around any of these bases. One and in three they, women, I think, are sexually assaulted. Yes. In What's one that? One in three women are sexually assaulted on Okinawa? in the military. Yeah. In, in the military. Oh, in, within the military, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I once talked to a Canadian woman officer, and I, she was in Afghanistan, 
And I said, what was the most dangerous part? She said, going to the latrines at night and not getting raped by the Marines. And yes. I kind of chuckled. She said, no, no, that was the most dangerous right. part. And that's another war in itself right yeah. there that females are dealing with in the military. Yep. Well, thank you for fighting for life, both of you. That's the real fight. Thanks and for having us. Thanks for having us, Chris. And thank you for watching Days of Revolt. Had to eat out the watermelon patch. And you know they put me in a shack.